Let's go through the steps of deploying a Laravel application on a server running Nginx. Before we jump into the steps, let me go over what I have set up so far. Obviously, I have an existing Laravel application, and I've got it uh, in a repository on github.com. So here's the application. I just simply called it demo. It's just a boilerplate Laravel application. I haven't made too many customizations to it. I've got it running here locally. You can see I just customized the welcome page. The other thing I have is a web server running Nginx with SSH access. So I've just got a web server set up with DigitalOcean, but of course this would work with any hosting provider. Uh, and in terms of SSH access, I am connecting to my server via VS Code, I'm doing remote development with their SSH plugin. So right now this window is connected to the server, so I can interact with files here, I could interact via command line with the server, and that's how I'm gonna do all of my work. Uh, this isn't necessary though, you could also just open up your command line program uh, and SSH into your server and do all of the interactions there, it's really up to you. To access my server in the browser, I have uh, configured a domain to point to the IP address of that server. And just to show that, my domain provider is Namecheap. The domain I'm going to be using in this case is my codewithsusan.com domain. Within my DNS settings, I created a subdomain demo that I'm going to use specific for this application, and it's pointing to the IP address of my server. Now, in my case, I'm using a subdomain just because I didn't want to interfere with my main domain, but of course, you could use a primary domain for this as well. Uh, just to show that this is connected, let me open this up in the browser. And right now it's just pointing to the boilerplate splash page that DigitalOcean servers are set up with. By the end of this video, this should be pointing to my application just as I was seeing it locally. And then the final thing I have set up is a SSH key pair between my server and GitHub. So I'll be able to communicate with GitHub and clone my project. Uh, if this is something you don't have set up yet, I do have a guide that walks through the process of doing that. Uh, and in general, if you have questions about any of these prerequisites that I've shown, feel free to ask a question in the comments below. But with all that set up, let's jump in. First thing we need to do is just make sure that our server is ready to run a Laravel application. And for this, we're going to go over to the Laravel documentation under server requirements and see what the current requirements for Laravel are. Uh, which as of this recording, we're looking at Laravel version 10 which requires, uh, requires at minimum PHP 8.1. Of course, if you're watching this video in the future, we might be dealing with future versions. Uh, if that's the case, just swap in the appropriate version number for whatever you're seeing when you're currently looking at the documentation. In addition to a minimum PHP requirement, there's a bunch of PHP extensions we need to make sure are installed on our server. All right, so to go through and check that we have all of this, let's start with the PHP version. Coming over to my server, the first thing I'll do is just invoke PHP with the version flag. And you can see it's reporting 8.2. So we meet that 8.1 requirement. Uh, but this is just for PHP from command line. I need to also make sure that Nginx is using the appropriate version of PHP. And the way I'm going to determine that is I'm going to first go over to my main document root on this server. And within here, I'm just going to create a file. I can load my browser. I'll just call it uh, info.php. And then within this file, I'm going to enter PHP and then just invoke the built-in PHP info function. This is going to dump up, uh, dump out a whole bunch of information about my server. All right, so I'm going to save that. Let's go back to the browser, go back to where I have my uh, server accessed here, and we're just going to pull up that info file. All right, perfect. We're seeing uh, PHP version 8.2 here as well. Uh, now, if your server is not running the uh, minimum version of PHP required, I do have a separate guide that talks about how to upgrade PHP on your server. Moving on from the PHP minimum requirement, uh, we need to check those PHP extensions. Remember, that's this uh, list of extensions we see in the documentation. Uh, the way I'm going to check this is I'm going to have my server output the list of extensions I currently have installed using the PHP with the uh, module flag. So it's just going to be php-m. All right, so I see a long list of uh, extensions. And what I would want to do is go through this one by one, cross-check it with the list of extensions that Laravel requires. Uh, and I already did that before recording this video just to save some time. And here's the results that I found. Um, I had most of the extensions except for this DOM PHP extension and this XML PHP extension. So to get them installed, I'm going to use apt-get, a uh, dependency management program common to Linux systems. And the first thing I have to do is specify the external repository where we're going to get the extensions from. So following the notes, I'll start by copying and running this command. Hit enter when it prompts you to do so. 
And with that done, we just need to now update our uh, package list from our repositories. And now finally, we can build our command that's going to install the extensions that we need. So that's going to be apt get install. And then for any of your PHP uh, extensions that you identified um, as needing for Laravel, you're just going to prefix the name of the extension with the version of PHP that you're currently running. Um, in addition to XML and DOM, which I need, I'm also going to be pulling in zip and unzip. These are not PHP extensions. They're just general server extensions. These are extensions that Composer, the dependency management program we use within Laravel, uh, is going to be using. If we don't have these on our server, we're going to get a bunch of warnings when we run Composer. So I'm just going to go ahead and include them as part of this process. And then finally, I also want to pull in the PHP MySQL extension just because that's typically the database type I run on my Laravel applications. Uh, it's not a strict requirement to run Laravel, but to the extent that you're going to be doing database work with MySQL, you would want to include that as well. So adapt this command as uh, appropriate for your server, and then uh, you can run it. In my case, I'm just going to copy it directly from the notes and run it. And we should be now all set with our extensions, but let's just have PHP output its modules again, just to confirm. You can see we've got that XML extension we were missing before, as well as the DOM extension. So with that all set, the next thing we need to make sure our server has access to is uh, Composer our uh, PHP dependency management program that Laravel uses. And you can see in my case, I don't yet have that installed. So coming back to the notes, I can get it set up with just a few commands. First thing I'm gonna do is go into my user bin directory. This is a common location for command line based programs. So that's where I wanna install it. Uh, once I'm in there, I can use the curl command to download the composer installer from the getcomposer.org website. And the resulting program has this .phar extension, which we don't want. So I'm just going to rename it or uh, move it. So we're going to say composer.phar to simply just composer. And now I can invoke composer. And in my case, it is going to warn me about running composer as the root user, which is not recommended. You can see I'm logged into the server as the root user. Uh, the reason for this is uh, the root user has like the highest privileges on your server. So uh, we don't want Composer and any of the outside dependencies we're working with to potentially do bad things on our server with those admin privileges. Um, in my case, I created the server just for this demo and I'm going to be uh, deleting it after this video. So this isn't a real world server. Uh, and so I didn't take the time to create a separate user that I could log in as. I just logged in quickly as the root user. So in my case, I'm just going to ignore this warning. But if this was a real world server, I would want to do things differently. I would want to have a separate user I logged in as and interacted with the server. All right, so long story short, in my case, I'm just going to say yes so that I can proceed forward. All right, and at this point, we're just checking that Composer is actually running. You can see we get all of this useful output about Composer, how to use it. Uh, and that's the main thing we want to see at this point. And with that, that was the final prep work we had to do on the server to get it ready to run a Laravel application. Now we can actually focus on the application and get that running. And the first step to do that is cloning it from GitHub. So for my example, I'm going to clone it into this directory. Uh, as we saw a moment ago, we already have a subdirectory within here called HTML, which is like the default document root that DigitalOcean sets us up with. So I'm just going to put it parallel to that in var www. Uh, then within there, I'll run git clone with the uh, SSH address for my repository. Uh, and where you can find this is if you're looking at your repository on GitHub, click the green code button, make sure SSH is selected, and that's the address you're looking for. So I'll copy that, go into my www directory and git clone that repo. And with that done, I should now have a directory within here named after the repo. And if we go inside of that, look at the contents, we should see all of our uh, expected Laravel code. And with that there, I'm gonna go ahead and open it in my file explorer just to make it easier to work with. And looking at our code here, uh, we can observe that we're missing the very important vendor directory which is where all of our outside dependencies exist. Uh, and the reason we're missing that is because uh, conventionally, we don't include that as part of our version control repositories. In fact, if we open up our git ignore file, we can see the vendor directory is purposely ignored uh, because it's all outside code that Composer should manage for us. It's not something we need to track as part of our uh, repository. Uh, so knowing that, we have to invoke a Composer to build this vendor directory for us within this new context in which we're running this application. So let me pull back up my terminal window and then within my application, I'm going to invoke Composer to build that directory for me. Uh, and there's two possible commands I might run at this point. Let me go back to the notes uh, to reference this. 
Uh, the first is a composer install command, uh, optimize autoloader no dev. You want to run this if you're building this application on a production environment. In other words, the real world version of your application that your users are actually going to interact with. Uh, for two reasons. One, uh, it's going to exclude any of your development specific dependencies, things that you don't need in a production environment. It's going to also uh, optimize your auto loader. This is going to make uh, it easier for class locations within your files. Definitely something you want to optimize on production. Uh, and then finally, by using the install command, when it's getting your packages and seeing what versions it should get, it's going to reference your composer.lock file, which is a file that when you're working on your application in development, uh, it's going to write the specific versions you're working with in development within that lock file. And so by running composer install on a production environment, it's going to basically make sure it's using the exact versions that were used in development so everything's consistent. Now, if you're working on a development context, let's say this is a development server you're setting up, you would simply just run composer update. Uh, this is going to include any of your development specific dependencies. Uh, and it's also going to get the latest versions of uh, your dependencies within your uh, version constraints that you've listed in your composer.json file um, and write them to that lock file. All right, so that's a bunch of extra stuff about Composer, but long story short, development context, we run this command. A production context, we would run this command. Um, and in this case, I'm going to treat this like a production server, even though this is just a demo. So I'm going to choose this first command. Again, I'm going to bypass this warning about running as the root user. And with that complete, we now have our vendor directory. Next up, we need a environment file. Uh, this is something that is also ignored from our repository because the environment file contains configurations that are specific to the different environments in which you run your application. And therefore, it's not something that you want to be synced uh, with the rest of your code. Uh, and because of that, we have to manually create it whenever we set up our application in a new context or a new environment. Now, the way I'm going to create it is I'm just going to create a copy of this .env.example file that's going to set me up with my base configurations and I'll just edit it as appropriate for the server. Uh, so uh, I'll do this via command line. I'll just say copy.env.example to a new file called .env. All right, and then once that's created, I will open it in my editor and go through and make the necessary changes. So I'll go from the default app name of Laravel to demo. I'm going to set this to be a production environment. Um, I'll come back to the app key in a second. Uh, for debug, because this is a production environment, typically I would set this to false. So debugging was uh, turned off. In other words, if there was any errors in my application, it would actually suppress them with a generic error page. But because I'm deploying this for the first time, and there might possibly be some kinks I want to work out initially, I am actually going to toggle this to true. Uh, but if this was a real world production server, once everything was working, I would want to come back here and make sure debug was set to false. Uh, for the URL, I will enter the subdomain I'm using for this app. And for the purposes of this demo, that's all I need to change right now just to get this application working. I could come back to this environment file uh, later as needed to make other customizations. Uh, and typically the other customization I would make when first setting up an application would be my database information. That's a bit of a whole other can of worms though. So I actually will create a separate video on that, how to set up your MySQL databases and make the initial connection. But like I said, let's proceed forward. This should be enough uh, to, to get this working. And proceeding forward, I do need a value for app key, but this is not something I'm manually gonna enter. I'm gonna instead have Artisan generate it for me. Artisan being Laravel's built-in command line utility. Uh, so down here in the command line within my application, I'm gonna run a PHP Artisan key generate. All right, you can see it entered the key for me. Uh, and this uh, key is just gonna be used for encryption purposes when this application is running. And with that set, we can close out our environment file. And let's just jump back to the notes to check in on where we're at. We got all our dependencies. We just built our environment file. We set our app key. So our next step is to deal with some permissions. Specifically, we need to make sure that our application storage and bootstrap cache directory are both writable by the server. Because when we run our application, it's going to be writing files to those directories, things like error logs, session data, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in order to do this, we have to first figure out what user on our system our web server is running as. And I have a command that's going to uh, do that for us. It's basically going to look at our processes, find the Nginx process, and show us what user that process is running as. So just copy this from the notes, run it on your server. 
And in my case, you could see the owner name I'm looking for is www-data. So knowing that, I'm gonna run two change ownership commands that's gonna change the ownership of the storage and bootstrap cache directory to be that WW data user. Uh, in your case, uh, if it's not WWW data, you would just swap this out as appropriate. All right, so let's run these one after the other. And with that, that's all we need to do to the code base itself. Our next and final step is to configure the web server to actually load this application. And coming back to the notes, the step to do that is we're going to create a server config file and we'll create it within this etc nginx sites available directory. So I'm going to copy this from the notes, go back to my server, go into that directory, create a new file. I'll just name it after the application itself and paste in that server config. And within this config, I want to change the name of the server as appropriate. So in my case, uh, the server name I'm using is demo code with Susan.com. And then for the root, we're going to specify the directory that should be targeted when we access this server name. And so of course we want to point it to our application uh, directory, but specifically we want to point to the public subdirectory. So that's this directory here. This is the only directory that should be actually accessible in the browser for this application. Uh, when we load the application, this index file is going to load and that bootstraps our entire application. Um, the server is going to have access to the other files within our application, but this is specifying just the web accessible directory. So uh, in Laravel applications, it's always going to be that public subdirectory. Uh, the final thing we want to check through here coming down is this uh, fast CGI pass line. You just want to make sure that the PHP version here matches the version of PHP you're running on your server. So in my case, that's 8.2. I don't need to make any changes. And that should be good to go. So I'm going to save the changes. And then to enable this site config, what I need to do is I need to create a link from this file, from the sites available directory, to my Nginx sites enabled directory. That's effectively how we enable sites on Nginx. Uh, so we're going to use the link command to do that. And in my case, I can copy this directly from the notes. Uh, in your situation, you will want to copy it and then just update demo to be whatever the name of the config file is that you created in the previous step. So I'm going to run that. And just to check that it worked, let's go over into the sites enabled directory. If we look at the directory contents, you could see the symbolic link. So uh, there's this reference to that demo file, which it's uh, locating in my sites available directory. Uh, just to make sure we did everything correctly, we can run nginx-t to check our nginx configs. Uh, always a good idea to do this, so I'll run that. Looks like everything is checking out, so the final step is to restart our nginx server to make these changes take effect. And let's test it out by trying to pull it up in the browser. Excellent. We're seeing the same thing we saw when we were loading the application locally. Uh, we're not seeing any errors. Uh, I do have a route we can test within this. Uh, it's under just forward slash test. You can see that that's working. So our routing system is working. Uh, we're good to go. Now, if you got to this point and it's not working on your end, uh, you can go back to the notes that accompany this video. At the very end, I have a link to another guide called Common Laravel Installation Issues, which will walk you through the troubleshooting process to figure out why it might not be working. Uh, and then, of course, you're always welcome to leave comments below. If you have questions, I can help guide you and get you unstuck.